Well, I suggested in the last uh, talk that when we're talking about Darwin and Darwinism, we really should uh, keep in mind that there are two distinct principles, theories, you know, claims uh, that, that constitute what we would call the Darwinian view of nature. One is uh, the principle of evolution, the idea that species change. And the other is the principle of natural selection, the idea that the way that species change is through accumulation of uh, new traits that are introduced uh, because they help the individuals who have them survive and reproduce. And that the accumulation, again, of these small, relatively small changes over long periods of time results in a big change, you know, cumulatively a big change, uh, which we would call species change. Uh, I think that when we look at Darwin's text, we should keep these two things in mind. Um, here, uh, he puts it very forcefully. Uh, the, you know, the, the ramifications of the first principle of evolution on how we regard human beings. He says, the great principle of evolution stands up clear and firm when these groups of facts are considered in connection with others such as the mutual affinities of the members of the same group, their geographical distribution and past and present times and their geological succession. It is incredible that all these facts should speak falsely. That is what Darwin has tried to provide is empirical evidence that uh, human beings like the rest of natural things have uh, evolved, which means, you know, one of the things perhaps we should mention is that evolution itself um, implies common ancestry. That is <clears throat> that uh, human beings like the rest of living things are uh, have common ancestor with other living things. You know, that is that uh, that there is a um, commonality of descent, a relatedness. You know? um, so that just as, well, let's just say the, the mammals, you know, that uh, we know, for instance, that 65 million years ago, the largest mammal on earth was a tree shrew, maybe the size of a squirrel or something like that. And that, that's our common ancestor with, with every other mammal that exists on the face of the earth. Um, we have uh, common ancestors that are closer with, especially with the apes and monkeys, but that ultimately we have a common ancestor with everything that, that the human species emerged out of uh, nature, um, but that it had uh, common ancestors with, we have common ancestors with all sorts of non-human creatures, right? Uh, yeah, so um, it is incredible that all these facts should speak falsely. So it would be incredible, it would be unbelievable uh, that all these indications that we have evolved as a species and that we are related, therefore, to other species, that we have common ancestry with them. It, it's impossible. It's just, it, it's just, it, it's, it's not impossible. It's incredible. It's just not believable that somehow all of these facts should speak falsely. And here's a really powerful and provocative statement, I think, that comes next. He who is not content to look like a savage at the phenomena of nature as disconnected cannot any longer believe that man is the work of a separate act of creation. Um, well, that is quite a claim. Um, basically saying, if you believe, at least scientifically, Maybe you can believe on the basis of faith, but then things get very complicated in terms of like what you actually believe about reality. But what he's basically saying is if, if you believe that, that human beings, man, is the work of a separate act of creation, for instance, as described in the opening uh, chapters of the book of Genesis in the Bible, you're basically looking at nature in a primitive, pre-scientific way. Uh, you're looking at the phenomena of nature as disconnected. You're, you're basically rejecting modern science, which generally sees nature as being governed by um, laws of nature that, that connect up different phenomena. Uh, 
Um, if you insist, he seems to be saying, that, that human beings are have an utterly different origin than the rest of nature, then you're basically taking an irrational view of nature. There's a lot of people who not only would be offended by that, but who would uh, dispute that. But that is the claim here. And it, he, he does have some reason for saying it, right? Um, that is basically this, and this goes to the first point, the evolution point, that, that as we begin to reconceive ourselves after Darwin, we, we have to see the human species, well, sort of like Marx, seeing as having a history rather than something that's been around forever or something that was created uh, in, in the form that it is now. And that the, the story of the Bible basically doesn't allow for evolution in the way that it's told. Uh, when God created the first man and the first woman, he created them out of clay or whatever. But he created them in the form in which we now find ourselves, essentially. Be a little complicated, but that's the idea. Um, the Darwinian view is that uh, that is to look at, if you were to still believe that, literally, you'd basically be looking in a pre-scientific way. That's what he means, like, like a savage, like a, a person who comes from a culture that, that does not yet have any grasp, any rational grasp. Of, of reality, especially of nature. Um, once we begin to understand nature scientifically in the ways that he suggested, we can no longer believe that we are the work of a separate act of creation. We have to see ourselves as natural creatures, animals that have emerged out of nature um, and uh, that uh, we are related uh, to the rest of nature. This does in itself uh, demand, or did demand, I don't know. I mean, we, we've grown up with Darwinism, right? We, it's been part of our intellectual environment since we began thinking and, and learning about, about nature. Um, but it certainly had, a, and, and continues to have, I think, a revolutionary impact. Just that notion that human beings um, cannot be thought of as having separate origins, and, and that they evolved out of, from common ancestors uh, with the rest of nature is uh, quite a different view, I think, of human nature. Of course, the second, um, the second idea or the second uh, part of Darwinism, uh, the idea of natural selection, um, is uh, equally revolutionary in terms of how it asks us to reevaluate or see anew our own nature. Um, the idea that all of our faculties, all of our physical and behavioral and psychological uh, structures, you might say, uh, are the result of uh, natural selection. And we have them because, let's say, let's call it their survival value. Uh, that they had a practical, that they, they evolved in us for practical reasons is an equally difficult challenge, I think, for human beings to come to terms with in terms of how they understand themselves. I said last time that if I think about why I have opposable thumbs, I can come up with a pretty, uh, pretty sensible story of how uh, my capacity to, to grip things with my opposable thumbs is a result of natural selection acting on my ancestors because having those opposable thumbs helped them to survive. Right? Um, but when it comes to other things, and here I'm thinking of what he says here, the high standard of our intellectual powers and moral disposition, then we get into territory which is maybe a little closer to home. Maybe it's not so difficult for me to admit that my, the structure of my hands is a result of a chance physical process of natural selection working on variation over very long periods of time um, on my ancestors, the human, spe the human species and pre-human species. When we start talking about my capacity to think and my moral disposition, my, my, my intellectual and moral nature, then, then it's a little, wow, are you saying that those things evolved by way of natural selection too? Yes, that's exactly what Darwin is saying. 